technology. I love it all. Okay, let's go ahead and briefly start. Uh, as you can see, I'm the presenter. My name is Raymond Friedman. I am the CEO of Mile 2. And uh, the focus that we'll have this evening is cyber attacks with advanced but persistent threats. And of course, here is the topic of discussion. Uh, some things that will be uh, that we'll go over is a hack. How much does it cost? What what are these funny things called advanced persistent threats? What's the impact of advanced persistent threats? And of course, some of these case studies. We'll be able to only have enough time to go over the NACHA uh, case study, as well as the Verizon reports that have been increasingly popular. I mean, they're working and collaborating with global organizations and governments to get very meticulous and granular details as to what all of these things are. And then we'll have the 97.3. It's kind of something I came up with, as well as uh, some uh, countermeasures. So these are just four very brief points. And uh, these are very elusive uh, uh, concepts and verbiage and numbers that we've been able to associate as to what a hack really costs. But uh, when you start thinking about it, uh, we've got this organization called the Yankee Group. And they indicated that uh, we're looking at usually if an internet just simply goes down. And this is generally speaking. You're looking at about $1,000 per hour. Of course, that's drastically different if we're looking at an Amazon or an eBay. And of course, in circumstances, in which stolen IDs, passwords are used, the average loss could be up to $1.5 million. And some of these attacks, hey, uh, they've been assessed for tens to $50 million uh, altogether. And so nobody really knows how much these things cost, but we know this, that it hurts the overall uh, profit and margin of an organization. We know that it has direct impact to uh, their market share, their intellectual property. Those things are compromised and even intangible uh, uh, costs. Uh, the, uh, uh, the atmosphere, the culture, individuals think we're not working for an advanced organization or a slothful organization or a valuable organization. People don't want to invest in an organization that's been compromised. So here we have here the Ponemon Institute. They did this study. And they said about 75% of all lapses uh, evolved because of internal breaches. And 26% of the time, it was malicious out of that 75. And out of all these breaches, we've noticed that about 58% uh, evolved simply from mobile devices and uh, laptops and PDAs. We've increasingly grown into an environment and culture that we're uh, very dependent on these little gizmos. So what's this relationship of a hack and advanced persistent threat? And I'd like to go ahead and define that. Uh, an advanced persistent threat can be described as slow and low. It's a, it's a cyber attack that uh, basically focuses on valuable intellectual property and servers such as that. When we start thinking about which organizations and who is targeted, we think about organizations that are uh, highly in uh, Europe or in the US because that's where all the value is. That's where all the money is at. So, how do we characterize this advanced persistent threat? Well, first of all, we can say it's an unauthorized software that's usually resident on a, ta a targeted system. Secondly, it's usually dormant. It's undetected and it goes on for long periods of time. And all the while, uh, as it compromises this server, it's just habitually sending information to remote servers, to criminal enterprises, and foreign governments. So you have to ask yourself, why this target? Well. You know, one of the biggest reasons why these uh, individuals do this is because, well, they can avoid very costly research. I mean, think about it. When an individual steals information or they steal somebody else's product, they're able to take out that product into the market space much quicker than their comp competitor. They're able to offer the product at uh, a lower cost. And that's why, because they've skipped out on that, that very expensive research, that very costly process of developing that product. And of course, think about this, uh, stealing classified and sensitive data. That's extremely important. Uh, thieves uh, all over the world are, are sometimes more interested in some sort of utility grid or some sort of sensitive information on national defense. And that's why uh, individuals have classified advanced persistent threats to be more of espionage, more 
uh, trying to support in the back end anti-military or economical warfare. And that's just a few days ago. I, I, I'd like to suggest if you, any of you are following our tweet, which I encourage you to do so, we found out that recently a U.S. government uh, box was compromised by a Chinese hack right in the White House. And what, uh, what was the means? It was through spear phishing, which we'll go over. So the question again is raised, why does China do this? Well, they're after very classified and sensitive data. That's where the military trade secrets are. They're on our government boxes. So we ask ourselves, should we be concerned? I mean, is this something that really applies to me? And, well, you've got to acknowledge the fact that, yes, it, it's a real threat, and it does apply to yourself. It, it applies to your organization. The issue here that we're uh, facing is that these... These hackers are ever-growing in skill. Their skills multifaceted. They're innovative. They're, they're creative. They're resourceful. The Internet has given them such a, 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 an incredible access to availability to world resources. And that's just what they are. They're advanced. Uh, they're persistent. And certainly, they are a threat. Now, I'd like to go ahead and describe each word. They're advanced because, well, they're not black hat professionals anymore. Uh, they're, they're these individuals that are uh, disciplined. Uh, they are not these so-called kitty hackers that we're used to. They tend to be very skilled and very sophisticated. They have a very sophisticated logi uh, logistical infrastructure. They also have extensive resources available to them. And they're used lucratively to campaign. And their object is one thing. It's to compromise a government. It's to compromise a commercial entity. And who are these agencies that are behind these threats? They're hostile states. They're organized crime. They have the time. They have equipment. They have the resources. They're no longer this guy in a basement somewhere with a six-pack of Red Bull and a bag of Doritos. No, they're not doing this for fun. They're doing this because this is their job. This is how they're making a living. This is their career. Okay? super black hat professionals. They are uh, persistent because their methods are, well, they're calculated. They're tenacious. They're not going to be easily detoured. They're looking a way to get in. They are stealth. They avoid detection. They're looking for that long-term goal, for that big reward. And they're looking for that one new groundbreaking drug. They're looking for that source code, that one new cutting edge in application. They're looking for that one uh, state-of-the-art engine, and this is a far cry from what we're used to from these amateurs who are so busy stealing little credit cards. They're not kitty hackers. They're there to exploit. They're there to discover, and that's the contrary to kitty hackers. They don't care if they're found. They don't care if their plot is disclosed and, and uh, people become aware. They, uh, they're very different. They are the Jedis of, of the black hat uh, professional arena. And certainly, they are, are certainly a threat. They're a threat because the perpetrators have these resources, and they're motivated to succeed. And when they do, it's a, it's a huge gain. And, of course, it's a massive financial blow to those who they are targeting. Now, these advanced persistent threats, we're not going to go in great detail, uh, but they do have a life cycle. And uh, it, it's very simple. They're, they're after, again, intellectual property. They're, they're after uh, financial assets. They're after uh, reputation. And this is what they've got. They, they target organizations. Secondly, they gain a foothold in an environment. And some of these common tactics include spear phishing, these emails. And once they're in, they use the compromised systems as an access in this targeted network. And from that target, what they do is they begin to deploy new tools, uh, all kinds of tools to help them uh, accomplish this uh, attack objective. And all the while, the whole time, they're covert. They're covering their tracks. And they continue uh, to maintain this access for future initiatives because their goal, again, is for long term. They're stealth. Now, the uh, case study from NACHA, now, for those who aren't familiar with NACHA, uh, don't uh, be confused with NACHO. <laughs> NACHA is a, an electronic payment association that oversees the processing of billions of transactions each year. Now, in 2009, uh, the, the phones are ringing. 
uh, the, you've got consumers on the phone, you've got financial institutions, they're clamoring to, and they've got questions. They, they want to know what's going on with these emails which they believe have been uh, sent by NACHA. And uh, these emails are telling them that uh, there's problems with their payments. Well, it didn't take them that long to realize that they had been hacked. And unfortunately, this was the first incident of many. In fact, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't on, only continuous, but it became so frequent that these, they estimated these cyber criminals were so sending millions of emails a day, up to 167 million uh, emails in a single day, all of them fabricated using NACHA logo, their phone number, their physical address. They, they used their verbiage. They, they gave that look and feel and that authenticity of NACHA. And all the goal was filching, stealing, and taking consumer financial information. Now, what we've got here is, is we've got these spear phishing campaigns. And you ask, well, what's the big deal? What's the big difference between uh, spear phishing and uh, mass phishing attacks? And I'm, well, first of all, this spear phishing is an aggressive new method of cybercrime. I mean, it's, it's part of that life cycle uh, that uh, we had mentioned in advanced persistent threats. And it's when these online scammers, they're masquerading, they look legitimate, they look like a legitimate organization, a government agency, and they are targeting specifically, it is an intelligent campaign of individuals who they think are likely to open up these emails. It, it, it's nothing like what we're used to, these jumbled emails and you know, misspellings and typo scams. No, it's quite the contrary. These messages look identical. They're all, they look authentic. They are hijacking everything that they humanly can. Now, note the success if you could look onto the right side of this uh, uh, comparison. You've got one million versus a thousand. Notice the focused uh, campaign. You've got three uh, percent emails being opened versus seventy percent. Notice the click percentage: fifty percent. Okay. That's why uh, they are they are very um, uh, they are, they've got that very um, authentic look and feel. And notice the victims two two out of every a thousand. And notice the value that they were able to procure and to steal eighty thousand for every uh, uh, victim, which came out to about one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. And the cost of that campaign was only ten thousand. So there's the net profit of that campaign: a hundred and fifty thousand dollars in profit in by two victimized users by only one thousand targeted users so this is very specialized they are really looking to hone down and focus on who they're going to uh, take advantage of now the Verizon report here 2011 2012 a lot of very profitable information and uh, they, they found out that in many cases these breaches uh, that hackers uh, were able to exploit, well, they weren't very skillful. Uh, in fact, it was quite the opposite. It was simply this. It was simply that the company was not prepared. 97% of attacks were avoided by simple or intermediate controls. In many cases, they just simply were ignored. 60% of these attacks weren't even targeted, uh, they, they, were, they were targeted opportunity, but they weren't advanced. They weren't persistent, and they certainly weren't that major threat. It was all because of opportunity. Look, it's open. They're vulnerable. They're available. Let's do something. On average, uh, it, it takes uh, months for a company to be aware uh, that they have been compromised. In fact, to their embarrassment, it was up to 92% of the instances were discovered by third parties. Oh, by the way, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but you've been hacked, and, and that's extremely embarrassing. In fact, in most cases, the evidence of the intrusion was clearly present all the time. And you know where they were found? The logs. I mean, that's the first place that I go when we do an assessment and we do a penetration test. I want to find out and see how, how, what is the consistency in looking at the logs, right? And you'd be baffled. Oh, I look at them once a week, once a month. Oh, I don't look at them at all. Well, how do you know? that you're not a victim of a compromisation or a hack, a, 
Uh, how do you know that uh, you're not a victim of advanced persistent threat? All the while, someone is taking your IP. Yes, it is important uh, to invest in firewalls and IDSs, and they are hard to get through. I can admit that. We had to create an advanced consulting course to show how these things can be compromised by Cisco CCIE. And it's important to get these things. But how, but how much more important is it to actually sit down and look with your eyes these deviations, to look at the logs? I mean, what good are these boxes if you don't look at the logs and look at the information it's spewing out? Now, even more important, it, is, it, is, uh, um, it should always be implemented to have controls to make sure that these things are being adhered to, to ensure that logs are being looked at, little signatures and so forth. I mean, you just can't buy a product and replace that type of valuable uh, analysis. So what is, this, what is this real threat, right? Well, we don't have control over a lot of these associated risks. In fact, in many cases, technology is not the issue. All right? It's not technology that's the problem. It's, it's usually uh, our failure of implementing controls to avoid being compromised or to avoid compromising that technology. We know that it's social engineering that often the key towards a security breach. So easy to manipulate someone. It is so easy to uh, persuade someone to give you what they want. Now, uh, for example, when we go and do a pen test, my job is to do the social engineering. I love it. I sit down, I, I get to the front, and I think, hmm, how am I going to uh, work my way into this, uh, uh, in, into this uh, environment? Well, it was easy. I tag along. Tag along with an employee. I just walk right through. I talk to them as if they know who I am. I'm new to the company, what department. I'm in IT. Oh, great. Uh, th this is the real deal. I need someone's password, no problem. I represent the uh, IP division, and uh, I go to up to the, to the front desk. This is a real-life scenario, something I did about six months ago for a financial institution. And they hired me specifically to see, can I get someone's password? Can I get into the building? Can I get into the server? No problem. Was able to succeed in all those three facets. And, and you might ask, how did you do that, Raymond? It's very simple. I represent the IT division. I come to the uh, front desk and say, be sure we have a new application that's being installed at your logon. It will ask for your, your, your password, and then once you type it in, you'll be able to go ahead, and the installation will be Make sure you press next, next, next. I leave. I come back in about five, ten minutes. Uh, did, did you, uh, did you uh, reboot? Yes, but I didn't see the login. Well, that's funny. That should have been done. Okay, can you just do that for me real quick? They reboot. Nothing's coming on. All right, let, let me see what's going on. Uh, maybe something's wrong with your access controls. They give me the password every single time. It is so easy to manipulate somebody. You'd be surprised. So how do we stop this? It's through security awareness. It's through uh, learning and understanding these methodologies. It's about putting security in the forefront of your mind. We can't walk around and think, oh, it's about this fairy tale about some evil guy or the boogeyman hanging out in the closet. The reality is, is that security is a real deal. It's, it, is the, it is the infrastructure, it's the barrier that protects your organization from all its value. I mean, we live in a cyber world. So we look at some of these countermeasures. I mean, we, we're thinking about education. It's so important. It's so important to uh, be versed as to why you don't just download freeware or why you don't double click or why you should be cognizant to where the browser is taking you. Is it a legitimate location? Why it's so important to sit down and have a face-to-face -face discussion instead of saying, hey, here's this paper about security. Go ahead and sign off on it. It's important to have an intelligent dialogue about the ramifications should some of these things happen. And when we start realizing the outcome, that's when we become more sensitive. We become more aware, right? And it always has to. Security always has to come from the top down. If management doesn't have it uh, uh, directing it and showing and manifesting their desire to ensure that security measures is uh, most important, then what makes you think that uh, employee will go ahead and value the same thing?
So let's face the real problem. The, the real problem is, is that uh, advanced persistent threats are not the majority. It's a minority. 97% of it is just, uh, well, it, it's the simple things. And this debunks the myth of that super advanced guy constantly knocking at your door. Now, what's important is, is for us to understand that sloppy security is not the same as advanced persistent threats. So let's go ahead and look at them. Real advanced persistent threats entail about 3%, okay? And of, out of all these hacks, according to the Verizon report, it, it is that more sophisticated attack. It's that malware foothold that easily evolves from something simple infection to a full-blown network problem. It, it's, it's setting up exfiltration or sensitive data and planting into additional remote access backdoors. It's that latter point of backdoors, by the way, that gives APTs that reputation of being persistent because it just never goes away. It's like that bad virus. Now, what's that malware? Malware's Trojans, or backdoors, or viruses, or worms, or spyware, they're everything you don't want, right? And uh, the risk continues to grow. Uh, the, the fact is, is uh, uh, this, the distribution of malware, uh, this, this is the process of the distribution, right? So you've got this pattern, it infects one station, and it becomes an epidemic, right? It comes to email attachments, IMs. And then it gets a hold through physical storage. Believe it or not, it's when we take uh, these um, uh, laptops or uh, iPhones and iPads and we take them out of a secure infrastructure and we go into a compromised uh, network or infrastructure like our homes. Or I love this. I, I love when I go to a hotel and I decide to ping it. I could poison the network if I want to, although I never have. But you're able to go ahead and see all these transactions and you're able to see all the boxes that are on that uh, uh, wireless network or the local hotel network. And you've got users. You can have passwords. You could see where they're logging on. You could see whether they're at uh, the administrative uh, state, uh, what, what kind of access control they have within their computer. And you're able to go ahead and begin to, well, dig in. You're able to go ahead and unearth some of their stuff that they have on the laptop. That's what happened with a government agency. This guy went home with all the sensitive data. His computer got compromised. And now, you know, everything that the organization had, when his, everything should have been encrypted, well, everything had become uh, a freeloader. Everybody began to unearth and take everything that the guy had, and it began to be disseminated, publicly acknowledged. I can't go into which government agency this was, but it was from the States. All because somebody did not adhere to a simple control they were able to expose their box, their uh, data was not encrypted, and he, was in, and he was working all along on the administrative state with no password. Uh, if that isn't foolish, I don't know what is. And it cost them over $300 million, all because somebody didn't listen, didn't do the simple things. So you, they come through browsers, emails, file sharing. Uh, they, uh, so many individuals employees through, uh, uh, during employee time at uh, corporate um, networks, they go to untrusted sites. I mean, these are the things that uh, malware uh, travels through these mediums. And here's some countermeasures which you'll learn in our penetration testing course. By the way, social engineering is covered, penetration testing is covered, vulnerability assessments, these very important commercial and uh, open source tools. You've got antivirus, of course, personal IDSs, You've got anti-spyware, of course, port and process monitoring. Uh, of course, you've got FF port, registry modification detection. That's very important. Hijack this is that product. Land guard with system file integrity. Tripwire, that's very big. And, of course, uh, it's always very important to have malware reference uh, websites, Semantic, uh, McAfee, companies that I'm sure most of us are very familiar with. So what should we do overall? Well, if I could just briefly go through this. Number one, eliminate unnecessary data. I mean, why do some companies have data for, that's 10 years old? Why do they keep these old files that are no longer valuable or necessary to function as a company? Don't keep it. Some companies are keeping and storing CVV files, numbers. Why? 
You're not supposed to even have them anyways. Ensure that the breaches, uh, excuse me, ensure that essential controls are met. A lot of these breaches are coming from remote connections. Who's got remote connectivity? Who's, who's authorizing them? What's the process to, to, to have it and to uh, remove those type of credentials? Access. Audit all the remote services. Find out why terminated employees, uh, you know, why do they continue to have accessibility? You'd be surprised how many people have been terminated and still have the same access controls, still have access to VPNs and, and so forth. Test and review web applications. You'd be surprised. This is the uh, second and third most uh, way in, uh, in which hackers are coming through is compromising applications and code. Find out who's got access to the organization's world, this coding world. Uh, people are becoming more and more familiar. So when you have code and you go through a process, before it goes out to an external facing server, make sure it's tested. Make sure that you've done a secure coding process. Make sure that the persons that developed it didn't create a back door. And it happens, right? Audit user privileges, access controls, check them. Is the individual, if they're moved from one position to the next, do they still maintain the same access controls that should uh, be linked or should be associated to their, to their job function? If not, remove it, change it, right? And of course, monitor the logs. I can't preach that enough. Monitor the logs, monitor the logs, monitor the logs. And finally, educate your personnel because that's your greatest resources, right, is personnel. No user education, then people are going to walk around thinking, well, uh, security isn't valuable. Everyone's too busy trying to do their job, trying to finish all their job uh, uh, functions and points throughout the day. But security has to be there. So what, what, what are these summaries, this uh, advanced persistent threat? First of all, we've got to focus on the fundamentals. We, we've got to remember that basic security is essential. Otherwise, we're wasting our time, right? We're wasting our time uh, trying to figure out how to go back to the basics, how to do the foundational things, when all the while we should be focused on that 3%. Make sure that we focus on the essential security strategies and infrastructure and, and, and security uh, uh, programs. Most attacks, of course, are avoidable. As I said before, 97% of them are avoidable. They're not advanced, right? Sloppy security is not the same as advanced real threats. Design, develop, and evaluate programs continuously. That's where success comes, when a security program is relevant, when business uh, employees are aware, and they're communicating. They've got that language. There's an established balanced security posture. So what can Mile 2 do for you, right? Mile 2 can help you protect your network uh, against these attacks. We'll show you how to implement countermeasures. We'll show you where the vulnerabilities are, why these uh, boxes or why this is the medium in which most people exploit. I call it the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the time, uh, uh, this is where the exploits are happening. So we have to focus on that one area. Protect your intellectual property. It's so valuable. And IP is, uh, think about the, the, the value of IP of just Coca-Cola or uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken and their special ingredient. This is something we can relate to. But as discussed before, it's that code. It's that new engine. It's that new drug. I mean, this is very important. Enforce acceptable use policies. It's important to get that list, uh, that audit list, that control list, whatever list it is that is re required to ensure the integrity of your security policies. Learn how to plan, uh, plan implement, and build and maintain security uh, strategies. The strategy has to be consistent with the objective of the company. It can't be encumbering to sales objectives and revenue. You've got to work together. That's very important. It's not just about hacking countermeasures. It's also working as a team and how uh, creating an intelligent uh, security strategy focusing on corporate objectives. We'll also teach you about the latest and greatest. You've got to keep up with the most uh, updated methodologies of security. And that's what this technology is going to do. When we have, when you go through a multi-training uh, course, 
our material is habitually being updated. We just had another update in August. Every two, three, four months, our material is being updated to try to reflect the latest and greatest uh, hacks, again, on the 80-20% rule. Of course, you'll be able, as uh, you take our classes, you've got the, uh, the CE credits. It's very, very important. And so if you have other certifications, you can apply these continuing education credits. So what makes Mile 2 so good? Well, we started with the military, and we continue with the military. We design uh, our, I, I, our CISO course, our pen testing course, our advanced consulting course, our di uh, network forensics course, our digital forensics course, all was designed for the military, for the DOD, for the Air Force, for the Secret Service. And we try to maintain that standard. And of course, we've taught personnel from all over the world, every company you can think of, world governments, world uh, banks. Uh, we practice what we preach. That's what makes us so unique. We're not just a bunch of academics and nerds in the back trying to create algorithms or uh, specific methodologies. We're out there doing it. We don't just read about it. We do it. We create our own standards, our own processes. And that's what makes us so uh, intimately familiar with these technologies. Credibility, confidence, competence. When you take our training, you get certified. The reality is, is that uh, you're getting a credibility from uh, from an organization who is acknowledging you that once you pass your your certification, that well, there's a lot of value there. Why? Because we're globally respected. We got over 100 locations worldwide, and the same exam that's taken here domestically in the states uh, is taken in the UK, or is uh, taken in Dubai, or is taken in uh, in Asia somewhere, right? And of course, finally, uh, we've got confidence and competence. Well, technology is constantly emerging. Cyber war has become the most concerning issue that we've got to deal with. And with a cybersecurity certification behind your name, you'll be able to go ahead and tackle a lot of these issues. And being competent, you'll be able to do your job and your, func uh, and your function successfully. So, so here we have here just a brief career income. People say, why should I do this? Well, it pays. That's why. Because we need it. This is the next. Uh, here domestically in the States, nursing is big. Everyone is getting older. People are living longer. Well, guess what? We've become more and more vulnerable in the cyber age. Everybody has more gadgets, more iPhones, more iPads. This is what's ruling our universe. And the more technology we have, the more accessibility we have in the Internet, well, the more crime is going to happen, more uh, the more we become vulnerable, the more exploits are going to be developed. Why? Because this is the medium of information. And where there's a medium of information, well, there's money there. Money to be procured, money to be stolen, money to be taken. The income range is huge between 45 to 130. Uh, I, I can tell you this, my, my contractors alone get paid anywhere between four to 600 U.S. up to 1,000, depending uh, what what job function they're doing. Why? Because these are expertise that need to be developed. Corporations need security staff. They need uh, a security team. It's no longer, well, a luxury or an option. It's something that you've got to implement. And that's why Mile 2 is here. We've been around since 9-11. My, my family's in the military. My brother's in special ops, uh, you know, uh, high level, uh, which I can't go into detail. But the fact is, is this, is that this is what's in demand. This is what's being globally recognized. This is where the uh, technology world is going, and it is about securing technology, securing infrastructure, securing intellectual property, and that's why it pays. These are just some of the certifications we offer. Uh, we are experts at application testing. We are experts in general security that competes against CISSP. Uh, we uh, with CISO, we're experts in penetration testing, engineering, and, and advanced consulting, uh, wireless. Uh, I mean, there's just many avenues that you could take with Mile 2. These are just a handful of certifications we offer. And uh, we're, we're here. We're, we're very proud that we've been able to unite and work in conjunction with this university. Uh, and we're excited because we're now penetrating this market space to academic world, uh, going into the high schools and colleges now. Uh, because we want to go ahead and tap in to uh, this demographic group early because companies are hiring immediately uh, uh, and looking for these type of certifications and uh, CVs and resumes. 
So I'm going to go ahead and open it up for some questions. I'm sure we have a few. I don't know if I went over, but I'm sure we have enough time now. Uh, hopefully you guys fixed the bug for the digital forensics um, uh, presentation. Ray, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Thanks a lot, Ray. Um, actually, we do have some questions. Um, we have a gentleman here, Chris. Do you want to go ahead and ask him your question? Hi. Um, I had a question on um, on going through. Um, one question is like, what tools would you use every day? You know, if you had like 